are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Huh. We are another, back. We are back. a great week. Yeah, it's yeah, a beautiful. How you doing? Doing great. I'm doing great. Summer's waning. We're still. We have some heat, but nice. uh, we're moving into August here, and we're just. Uh, it's going to be uh, still being warm, so we're still going to enjoy it. Yeah. Before you know it, it'll be September. No, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I'm just saying. And you know, like your shows, you're at the, like your 70 plus show. Pretty soon, you'll be at the hundredth show. So it's like big anniversary show. We should like have all the artists we, on. Just saying. we will have. I'm sure we'll have something to. I won't promise anything. I can't promise. <laughs> we will. Uh, we will have some kind of uh, celebration. Whether we uh, we have uh, a shot of something, maybe. Uh, there you go. But we'll do. Something well, we have now. a shot of something here every day. Because before we do your show, we always do this cigar show. So um, are you? When I are see you, you I've already had a cigar and a scotch. How so, can you yeah. just uh, smoke a cigar a day? I don't know. Just like Can, you know, I it's it's helped. My doctor said if I wanted to stop chewing gum, I should smoke cigars. So uh, he's a doctor. I'm gonna listen to him. I think that's important. <laughs> so, so, reverse roles, okay? Yeah. Well, you know, my doctor is the same one that Rodney Dangerfield went to, Doctor Vinny Bubais. So uh, you know, I'm not sure if he has a real medical degree, but he's from Brooklyn. So how bad can he be? So there well, you hopefully, go. he had just a touch more education than Rodney did when he was showing. <laughs> <laughs> not sure. Yeah. Anyway, we have. Uh, Another great guest today. Uh, we have a uh, Patrick Bulis, uh, who is a, a printmaker, and mm -hmm. so we're going to talk about actual printmaking, not making just reprodu reproductions of something, but actual real printmaking. Uh, he's uh, he's got an MFA and a BFA from the University of Alberta in printmaking, and he is, uh, I guess, a, a technician at the University mm -hmm. of Alberta, or actually University of Saskatchewan. Um, so he helps people in the sessionals learn how to do become printmakers like students and that's his job he's a he's a technician so he knows his stuff that's what gotcha. i really want to know he knows how to do stuff and uh you know in his own work it it's kind of uh he uh and i'll call it this he explores cats and the mysteries of the universe that's well, a cat is a mystery of the universe. Yeah, so, that, you know. well, and he and i'm sure he'll say the same thing so his work reflects a lot of this these thoughts and uh, things. Um, let's just bring him in. There you go. Yes. There's Patrick. Patrick, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to let you and Paul have a wonderful show. I'm going to disappear and go beat up my dog for a while. Um, and we'll go, we're going to go look for a cat to chase. <laughs> Thank you for a while. And we'll see you at the end, guys. Have a good show. Cheers. Okay. Thanks. Good day, sir. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, good. Get through the summer here. You got a little bit of time. You a bit of time off right now, or are you you're still working in the session? No, so? kind of the opposite. I've been off since May, and I'm teaching right now, quarter four. So, in the summer, the summer sessions. Yep. You this busy time. Did you did uh, question? Did you did you work with Nick Seminoff at all, or in the days? Um, a little bit. A little. Um, he was more. He was probably more on the way out. Like he wasn't, he had a little, he had an office there, but he was working all the time. But yeah, I thought he, when I came in, he was teaching for his last time um, at the university. Right. Yeah. So did you learn any of the waterless lithography as well? Do you, do you know the processes of that? Or what he was uh, I, I do. Yeah. Um, I'm teaching it right now. So hopefully. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> That's surprising. A lot of people probably don't know much about. Uh, what waterless lithography is about, but uh, we're our our show today will be we're talking about your work and yeah uh, mm -hmm. and uh, wood block wood wood cuts and uh, mesotints and uh, I guess aquatints I guess that's what you Those so you're working on metal plate and you're also working with mm -hmm. wood uh, yep. yeah so what kind of wood what kind of woods do you use to you know to hold your relief together like how you're uh, basically just Baltic birch uh, yeah a little tighter grain wood yeah. Do you work at all on any end grain at all or for like, like wood engraving? Yeah. Well, I've tried a little bit of it, but um, I keep on coming back to the, the <laughs> it's available. It's 
relatively yeah, it is available. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it is a nice tight grain wood and it, uh, it works. So what kind of sizes do you work uh, when you, when you have a wood block a lot of times? Um, usually small to medium. So quarter sheets. So the paper would be what 11 by 15 or maybe a half a sheet. Yeah. Uh, 22 by 15. Yeah. I've gone bigger a few times. It's really fun. It takes some more time. Yeah, it's uh, there's a little bit more carving to do and a little bit. So, what is it a reduction block? Is what how you work? Uh, is that when I work in costly, reduction? I also do just black and white. Yeah. So yeah, like a one off, just one like what you get, what you carve in is what you get. You don't keep removing. Right. Uh, the, yeah. So yeah, carve in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found. So what kind of what kind of like we'll talk a little about printmaking itself, sure. but mm -hmm. um, what kind of uh, volume can you get out of one out of one cutting like to get a good clean print how, how long does a, a wood block last like I where do they start deteriorating I guess is what we're saying I don't know um, I never do really large additions so I don't think I've ever pushed it to the point where it starts falling apart it starts falling apart yeah, yeah I so. guess I found that when I worked on block it, it mostly falls apart when you're defining small thin lines or mm -hmm. things that are tight together, like, and you've got a very thin line, those ones can break away on you uh, probably quicker than a mass area or a block area more mm -hmm. than anything. So in those ones, how many colors would you run on a reduction a lot of times? Uh, a lot of times I like using really transparent layers of color. So it's almost like glazing, like in a painting. So it could be like nine to 12 layers or so. Like build it up. Yeah. So when you get that to get good registration, is it a pin registration you use a little bit uh, with that? Or how do you, how do you register with a block? <laughs> with block? Uh, I'm embarrassed to say I take the block and I put it face down on the paper and then I flip the paper. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so, so what ha so the same thing happens to each color, like the same way. Yep. You, you don't have any stops or anything that you, you, you bang things up against or anything. You just, no, you got, you got a good eye. Like, <laughs> yeah, for now, but <laughs> yeah, I might change. Yeah. 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 You know, well, Hey, you, you use the processes that work uh, for you, I guess. Uh, I know a lot of people will get pin red, they'll pin register their papers and they'll, uh, they'll either use blocks that they'll bang things <laughs> up against. And so they you can always go to that same corner or that edge and to pull mm -hmm. up. Oops. So we're going to get Stephen to, just launch our first image. There we go. Just so we have something there up and we're going to talk about uh, as we talk about some of the work. So people mm -hmm. can sort of see that you're in you know, multiple colors that are in this piece. And, uh, and so can you, can you tell us a little bit about this kind of this, this piece of work, what the meaning I, I mentioned cats and universe. So mm -hmm. I thought I, I found that in your, uh, in your bio a little bit. And, uh, and as Steven says, he says, cats are the universe. <laughs> <laughs> They, they are, they are uh, I think, the Venus of things, you know, probably more than anything. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, this one's an really, it's an early piece. This is probably one of my first reductions. So this goes back over 20 years now. Geez. Holy smokes. Okay. Yeah. This is four layers, so it's not that many layers. Yeah. Well, and you just, what kind of paper do you, do you put it on uh, mostly? Is it a BFK or other things? Or the... If I'm doing woodcuts, yeah, Somerset or BFK. Somerset, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... So what kind of additions were... Are you, say, you're a low edition? So these are hand-pulled proofs that you do. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and people understanding what that is in others, there's... You are the machine, really, basically, when you're pulling these things. Yep. Um, so do you hand-rub these, or are they actually pulled through a press? Pulled through a press. Yeah, yeah. on these ones, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know there there's techni techniques of you know rubbing the backs of of, of proofs uh, to get your proofs. Um, mm -hmm. So do you usually do an artist proof, an AP proof as well before you edition, or do you have what kind of process um, do you use, or you just go right into it and do? Kind of go into it. I mean, for with reduction, you can't really do an artist proof because right. you have the same block. You print as many as you want up that one color, and they work back into your block. So you're constantly working to the block, basically destroying the block, so you can't go back and reprint it. Right. Yeah. So you kind of have to dive in. Yeah. So people understand what that is. Is 
you you would carve an image to start with say uh, your background block color mm -hmm. you would print that then you'd get the block again and you'd carve more into it you keep removing and removing the block so the block is slowly being destroyed as far as the surface there you can't go back it's nope. a, it's a one-way trip <laughs> and uh basically at the end it's uh it's probably a, a line piece of line work that hold it all together because that's all that's left is uh is the pieces um i i, I used to do a little bit of wood block on my birch but i used plywood <clears throat> and uh it had a limited life for sure uh just the plywood layers just fall apart you mm -hmm. get maybe up to 20 proofs of which maybe a dozen are in the higher quality end of it and then you'd have some that were probably not not really uh of the same quality as the first pro so as you pull more proofs the plate slowly gets destroyed is this basically the theory of what happens to a wood block yeah. Yeah, is that would you as an artist does that um affect the price of something so say you had a 12, 12 proofs that, <laughs> that were good. Um, how, did, how does that work in pricing? Like if, like if you were to sell that in your mind, right. a lot of times an artist will keep one or, one or two back for their own for sure. portfolio. Uh, so they always have a proof um, of the work. But as they sell, is in addition early on worth more money than the addition at the end? So in other words, one of 10, is it worth more? Because it put, technically it probably would be the best of the proofs because right. it deteriorates. So would one of 10 be possibly worth more than 10 of 10, the 10th one? Um, possibly. I charge the same for each print in the edition. So, okay. so yeah. I guess you were looking at, I found that anybody doing collecting, um, this is a great way to start an original collection like if you're starting as a beginning collector <laughs> um printmaking is probably the most economical thing to purchase as original art um uh, for somebody just starting out so they uh I encourage i guess i encourage a lot of people they say well where do i buy these um i said well go to the university bfa shows go to the mfa shows mm -hmm. i said a lot of times this stuff is the student is trying to sell the work and you decide whether you like it or not. And they said, if you're lucky, that person is on the upswing and they're going to, but you mostly buy for what you like, I would say more than anything. But um, I'd always found that, yes, I'd like to sell the work for the same money all the way through. But say you have a very popular edition and you only have two pieces left of it. You sold the other ones. Um, does that justify you know, raising the price a little bit because there's a demand for it? I guess we'll look at that one. Um, yeah, I've started to. I've have a few uh, editions that they're starting to sell out, so I only have a few left. So I have raised the price a little bit. Yeah, so it's part of that marketing thing that you have to all take, right? A little bit about you really, I mean, you have a job as well, you're teaching and things, but yeah, when you're, when you're moving through, I guess, an art career, mm -hmm. if you don't, if you don't move up. I mean, the cost of bread and milk and everything else is going up. Um, and you, but you also have to protect the people that have purchased your work. They <laughs> want to see that their work, that your work is going up in value uh, because they purchased your work early on. Um, so it's to them, it is not probably purchased as an investment, but it probably was purchased because they like the work and they know you and they know the work and they, they just love having those pieces around or they're cat people and they like pictures of cats or who knows what the real reason is. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's kind of nice just to be aware of uh, uh, those things as an artist when you're going through. But so this is one of the other images here. They just, it feels, uh, can you, can you explain a little bit? I mean, let's talk a little bit about your art journey. Well, this is up here on this one. So where, where did you actually, <coughs> you know, start what you're doing right uh i mean i've always been interested in art when i was growing up um you're from the edmonton area or were you yeah just outside of edmonton fort saskatchewan okay yeah so yeah i took the high school art classes uh not much printmaking in, in high school i think i did a little relief print and i printed a t-shirt 
and that was about the extent of my printmaking experience in high school. Yeah. And then I made my way to university, and um, I decided to get my BFA. Um, and at the University of Alberta, the first year is um, kind of a foundations year, so basics. And then the second year, you get to choose your um, studio areas that you want to try out. I took to painting, design, and printmaking. <clears throat> so I started in printmaking and silk screening. And honestly, by the end of that first term, I wanted to quit because I don't know, silk screening, um, every mistake that you can possibly think of, I made twice over. And the yeah. technicians were kind of looking at me a little bit worried. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 <laughs> yeah, it was. I reached a point, I had a, a gray apron when I was working in the studio and towards the end of the term, I wrote, help me on my apron. <laughs> to the technicians, because they were busy helping other people too, so. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, kind of, but then that, eventually I had that same apron when I started my master's and I was a TA and I was asked to do a demo. So I was, where, I was really nervous, it was my first demo. So I was nervous and sweaty and I had this apron saying, help me, and all the students were looking at me and it was, uh, <laughs> experience but yeah, yeah it well, wasn't really good printing that i really got into it yeah well i think yeah it, it is a, it is is it can be a daunting thing especially if you are um you're dealing with acids and you're etching and you're doing a lot of things that are caustic a little bit and understanding mm -hmm. that the health in a studio is really important um uh, Absolutely. For artists for any kind of ones when we have a long career in art. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the environmental aspects of things as well. Um, mm -hmm. But without that, you you don't have a long life in, in, in doing it. It's sort of like you don't lick your brushes like yeah. if you're a painter. <laughs> right. I love the taste of cadmium. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this, uh, yeah, and you know, I, I love how you can get these deep, rich blacks. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying you can get all that with a wood block. Like, is this a wood block print? Uh, this, a wood a block? Tint. this is one's a mesotint. So, yeah. so <clears throat> understanding the process of a mesotint, um, you, you're using a rocker just to to etch the background in. Yep. The whole thing, yep. So you're working on a metal plate for this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, copper. Yeah. On a copper plate. Yeah. So people need to understand this a process of, uh, and this is a smaller piece. This one probably, or yeah, this one's eight by eight, I think yeah. inches. So it's a nice, it's a nice size for people, and it's kind of leaves a lot of what is it in there? You know, it's it's got a uh, kind of a worldly feel, a universal feel to it. What was the title of this one? If you can remember, any, you sent me all the titles and I didn't yep. put them on the slide. Uh, I think it's my titles are longer back then. Uh, I think it was continuous light flow through a liquid core. Oh, okay. There so, you go. That would make perfect sense. <laughs> it feels very glass like. You feel the spheres feel very, uh, very much like you're looking in a, in a lab, like some kind of blown blown glass tube that would be laying on the counter. Yep. But, that's exactly what it is. Um, oh, no, no. I can't believe I, it. Yeah. No. Um, when I was doing my master's, um, like I was looking at astronomy and physics and going to the library a lot, but I was trying to find ways to experience that directly. Like, I, I, there's only so much you can do when you look at books and doing drawings from journals and whatnot. So uh, I eventually went to, um, they have a glass blowing lab on campus. They do all the vessels for um, yeah. labs. And they do it all by hand. I was surprised. I thought they would be more precise and they would use machines, but they're, their artisans working in this yeah. uh, studio and like it, it was it was incredible because they're giant vessels like some of them are you know several feet long yeah. to use in the labs and they have like underneath there's flames shooting up to melt the glass and form the glass and there's this noise so even though it's not quite like being in outer space but you get kind of that feeling of creation and energy and light in this little space plus they're using it for science so yeah so uh, yeah, I was amazed that they hand they hand do all that work at University of Saskatchewan. Actually, there's an older guy there that just he was a master glass uh, maker. He made all mm -hmm. the like the test tubes and all those things, like the things that they use the glass things for in science. They're all handmade. I couldn't believe yeah. it. Um, yes, even the curly tubes and the thing that go in. I can't, I thought you had to buy all that stuff. I guess the cost would be huge to buy and shipping and all your stuff. You get a lot of breakage and stuff. So. <clears throat> 
delicate pieces some of the works mm -hmm. but you never think about stuff like that that that's an artisan like he's a major artisan when you can you're working with hand blown glass yeah. at the university and it's being functional pieces like it's mm -hmm. kind of cool it's it's a it's a very cool process but very nice that you're able to use have the access to some of that and to use uh that in your work it just uh makes sense this is a beautiful piece this this is this explosion these these three panels that are so are they printed separately these panels uh no that's one big plate um, one big plate yep Okay. Again, is this a meso tint? This one. Uh, this would be an aqua tint. This one's an aqua tint. Mm -hmm. okay. So, what is the difference between an aqua tint and a meso tint? Like, if you were to tell somebody that we're going to do an aqua tint, what what would they is that what would they do in that process that's different than a meso tint? So, an aqua tint, you're using chemicals to create a texture on um, on the surface of the plate, so a chemical bath. Um, so, an acid bath of some kind to yep. etch the plate. Okay. Yep. Huh? And the mesotint, you're doing, you're getting that same kind of texture, but you're doing everything by hand. Yeah. So you're basically cross hatching with a with a tool to mm -hmm. to hold the ink, like when it's rubbed into the plate. Yep. So so these things would be the plate would be etched and laid flat on the table. Then you'd have your ink in your roller, and you'd roll ink over that, or are they hand rubbed. Like, um, hand rubbed. So. So the plate would be actually hand rubbed. You push the ink into the crevices, mm -hmm. and and then it's uh, you wipe all the excess away a little bit, and then you you do a print, and then you pull off and you re-ink, and you make your proofs that way. Is that is that correct? It was roughly, yeah, it's, yeah. roughly. It's a reductive process similar to the wood block earlier, but I'm okay. using instead of wood, I'm using um, etching or aqua tint. Okay, so you can make things darker and darker and darker. Yep, like the blacks get richer and richer the more you etch into it it yep. gets darker and darker okay so this is kind of an old world way of doing things this is stuff that uh, the day gods of the day would do or the the master uh you know would, would create plates in the day not so much with the etching but with the i guess they would etch plates yep. in the day yeah early 1800s 1700s when they're doing things so this can you explain a little bit about this one what what we're just talking about the content of this of this piece so uh, I was looking at the sun, so yeah, um, and then the panels. Uh, often in astronomy and physics and science, um, they look at like sequences or um, like little like microseconds of things moving. So I often use panels to kind of give the the idea that I'm observing and examining and exploring. So okay, yeah. <clears throat> You know, it feels very asteroid-like. There's this asteroid feeling, and then, but very uh, spatial. I mean, it has a very. It's a lovely, rich, rich piece. Uh, I love the the duotone look to it. Like mm -hmm. so, yeah. It just is a nice, uh, very different. You know, and I think that's the thing. You don't have to make everything so literal. I think you're yeah. using your imagination a little bit. And so, do you work from drawings that you do to start with? You have some drawings that build up. Yeah, I usually like if I guess I don't collect source material, um, and then I don't. I usually don't work directly from the source material. Uh, I'll start with drawings and then use the drawings for my plates. So it kind of gives me a chance to think about what I'm doing before I go onto the plate and make yeah. it more personal and yeah. more creative that way. Yeah, no, it's and it would be kind of hard to just draw this, like look up at the sun and do a drawing and just <laughs> burn your eyeballs out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these are I love these. I love the two panels because there's this conversation mm -hmm. in the two panels, right? There's one that uh the one on the right is very ethereal. It's just out there, right? There's this this spatial feeling. And now we kind of understand that you're doing kind of a science edge to things. Mm -hmm. Um and this is almost like is this kind of like mapping on the left side a little bit? Or is, would you consider it like that, like a topography look of mm -hmm. something? Uh, yeah, or another way of looking at what's been on the uh, the right side. So again, looking at different ways science look at the same thing through different spectrums or um, mm -hmm. different magnifications. Okay. Again, it's about observation and looking. So was, was science a big thing with you, like just or just the exploration, the understanding of 
that big universe is it kind of a under, trying to understand it is that why you kind of do what you do just get your finger on it to understand certain segments of it yeah yeah mm -hmm. when i was in high school i had to kind of choose between science and art so i chose art but um science was yeah. always still there so yeah well i i just find that it you know we have a lot of artists that are you know they do what they see in front of them they'll mm -hmm. paint of or they'll draw and they'll go plein air painting and they'll do those things and he said like you said you're trying to source your materials a lot of this material you don't see unless you have science magazines or you can look through a telescope or a mm -hmm. or a microscope right so you have to your source material is very different than a lot of other artists you know they just kind of uh the other artists can just go out and do a drawing of a life model or a, you know they can set up a display and do a painting of a you know of something like that but trying to find your material, you're kind of hunting through the National Geographic, and you're looking at where do you find these kinds of images. So are you influenced by photography a bit, a little bit in there as well? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. No, it's kind of a, yeah, I can see. Well, you got to, like you say, you've got to find a source material that satisfies you, but mm -hmm. also people can relate to, I guess, is, is what you're finding. Otherwise, it becomes just, it's very abstract in what it is it to start with yeah um and just understanding what yeah this again i i love i love the layers of how these pieces are creeping up or down from the light area and uh can you explain is is this one more plant-based or is this what is this one yeah very good um um yeah i got this came from a couple of things um i was reading um up on uh, freeman dyson he was a physicist okay he passed away a few years ago in his 80s uh, but back in the 60s he had a couple of theories it was the 60s um about uh, space exploration so his idea was to um seed comets with special i guess spores or seeds that would grow into trees so dyson trees and the idea is that people would live in these genetically modified trees and travel through the space again well, it was the 60s so um <laughs> i love I visual. Yeah, fantasial things are amazing mm -hmm. um it's endless, I think, with your imagination as to what they can be, right? Because it's you. And I think being inspired by writing is amazing, you know, to be mm -hmm. able to take that science fiction a little bit or take the idea of something and try to make something of understanding of your own of it. I mean, this has a really nice sense of light. Um, you can see the layers. I mean, how they just cascade back you know but he feels very spider like you know this thing hanging down from the top mm -hmm. and it's uh it's a it's a it's a very very unique piece of work yeah. um it, it's kind of of the pieces this is probably organic where the yep. other ones are more technical looking mm -hmm. where you've drawn circles and edges and things and this one this one has that uh i guess those organic edges about it they just kind of the other i don't know it is i don't know just go through some more. It's another one kind of based on the same design. Yep. Yeah. So these would be this idea of this uh, thing, this the spore or this thing yeah. that you're living in and traveling through space. Yep. And also at the same time, um, I was helping, um, well, uh, Jacob Semko. He's also yep. a producer living in Saskatoon. His parents were landscaping their house and he want, he asked me if I wanted any plants for my house. So um, we took the trees out of his yard and when you pull the trees out, you got this root ball. Yeah. And it's, I kind of compare it to like a plate in paper when you're printing, like when you pull the root ball, you've got the impression of the root ball in the ground. Yeah. You made that connection between like paper and a plate where that's kind of one and the same. Okay. That impression. So I really like that idea of this, boot ball and then you got the hole in the ground which yeah. is kind of the same shape yeah. the cavity that it left yeah. yeah i think i think a lot of uh it's a great observation i mean um and it's something that it's not that easy to do to depict those kind of things in in art you know if you in in, in a in a two-dimensional way to produce something that people could understand what you had seen that experience I think we're always trying to find the experience, right? Mm -hmm. And whether you're painting or drawing or whatever you're doing, it's just 
Um, they're trying to say, capture that moment, right? Or uh, can you feel my pain or is it hot out or whatever the reason why you were there? And they said, well, that's a unique experience. And as the understanding of the print, would I have got that information without you telling me that? Probably not, unless there's a, that's that kind of story that we like to hear about the pieces of work as to where an idea comes from. Because, oh, I can relate to that idea. Um, or I'm willing to accept that idea and learn from your vision. I guess artists are, I guess we're visionaries in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. See it, see, try to look at it in my context, you know, that kind of thing. I, I see life like this and uh, it's nice to see works. So these, this one would be, due, uh, how many colors would be pulled for this one? Yeah, eight or nine. Yeah, to get yeah. the richness in there, you can see that. <laughs> And one of those palettes that could go to mud on you real quick here. I could see that. Yeah. You know, if you do, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I just, it's just, you know, trying to re retain the whites, the light aspect yeah. of it. Yet you want some deep, rich areas that have that conversation between the top and the bottom. You know, the feeling that, like you said, you're pulling that root ball out and you're trying to feel that, uh, to explore that. Would I have ever got that from without you telling me? Probably not. Like it, it doesn't, but it, I, I feel there's a connection, but I don't know really what it was unless, <laughs> and I love the aspect, as, aspect of it and just kind of a very, very unique. Yeah. So love of animals. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your cat, you like, you got cats as well. I imagine you have a cat or so. Yeah. Uh, I do have two cats. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So where does this come in with, this is a fox or is it a coyote? Uh, two foxes and my previous cat, Lucy. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Previous cat being Lucy has passed on? Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, do you, do you do kind of memorial pieces like that? Like to remember mm -hmm. an animal from, or is it just the cat was there in the day and <laughs> yeah. you did it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, when I'm working in the studio, when I'm working on the larger, more complex pieces, the astronomy pieces, sometimes I need a break. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but I still want to be in the studio, so I'll do little little animal prints. I've done them throughout my career. Yeah. And they're they're honestly a, a intended to be kind of fun. Uh, take a break. Um, they're small. They're nice to give away for gifts or whatever. But um, I've never had Lucy. It's my cat. I've never done a print of my cat, so I decided to do one. The first one I did was her sleeping on a tortoise. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I kind of I liked it, so I did another one and another one. And I think I did about 27 mesotints in that series. <laughs> and it kind of took off, and it kind of took over <laughs> my practice. Yeah, really. off and over is probably right. Yeah. So the context of the of the fox, the two foxes, where is there is there a story in here somewhere uh, as to what these are about? Um, it's implied. Um, my first few prints in the series were Lucy sleeping with different animals uh, mm -hmm. because cats like to sleep anywhere. <laughs> they like want to sleep. And then after a while, I kind of had her acting with with other animals. Uh, I have a print where she's hanging upside down with bats. This one, she's jumping with foxes. Yeah. So uh, it's implied there's a story. It's not a specific story. Um, but it does kind of relate to like um, old illustrations, like yeah. mezzotint and etching. Like printmaking comes from a tradition of of communicating, telling stories, bookmaking, that okay. kind of thing. So it kind of it's there. It's implied. Um, some of the animal Lucy combinations have more personal stories than others, but um, I want to leave it open for people to kind of interpret what they uh, take from it. But um, well, there, you know, a lot of the illustrations were done for fairy tales and for, yeah, exactly. you, know, um, you know, fables and all those things. All those things were illustrated in the day mm -hmm. uh, to get a visual idea of the story that while it was being told uh, or read to somebody or something. So you get in your mind what Red Riding Hood looked like, what the wolf might look like, what these, mm -hmm. e these were evil stories in the day that would be told. Um, you know, with alcohol and everything, and scare the kids, and <laughs> and you and you want to you now they just become kind of old. Uh, they're fairy tales, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, 
but they 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 do have an old world edge about them, and they're they're beautiful beautiful drawings. Uh, yeah, yeah. I had a show with them in uh, Saint Albert, uh, and, they had, yeah. and they had and they had like school tours go through, and and their activity was to um, write stories based on my prints, which oh nice, perfect, exactly what I wanted them to take away from them. So I have a, a booklet of like kids' stories based on my prints. Oh, nice, really yeah. nice. <laughs> well, you know, I think. You know, I don't know what the publishing industry the way it is right now. It's it's a little over the top expensive to get into getting a book out and doing something. But when you say you have twenty seven different drawings or prints of your cat in a series, mm -hmm. there is there is a story in there somewhere, uh, and it's lovely to see how kids see your work mm -hmm. because that's kind of maybe saying, oh, that's the idea I inspired in that child which is maybe different than the other one and they probably influenced by what they have read and seen in their short life already and then they when they see your work and they say oh what where did where did those ideas come do you find the stories were quite varied yes the yeah 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 um yeah. oftentimes did any, of zero. <laughs> did, any, did any of them do any drawings um, yeah, actually, a few of them did like little sketch, little sk stick figures yeah. of the cat and like an alligator or yeah. a bear. Yeah. You haven't got into alligators yet, though, or anything? Um, I do have one. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah. Not sure if you want there, but yep. Moving on here moon phases and sun phase and planet phases and mm -hmm. moving. You know, people look at these things and oh, it's a ball or things, but. It's not the easiest thing to give something the classical lighting in a printmaking technique, right? So you're you're using a mechanical process and uh, an aqueous process to give you this feeling, and it's like I said, it's it's a learned thing of how to the technician of how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know the dark side and the light side to to just a sphere, um, so you know, it's got a, it's a. So is this a planetary thing that you were looking at, or? Uh, yeah, this one, yeah. This one was done during uh, the pandemic. I was at home, so I needed to do something. <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic ball. Okay. So, I think yeah. we all. I think we all have that. There's a two and a half year lull in something that e we either we were very productive. Yep. Or, or we became uh, closed in and can't get out feeling in a lot of our work. And, and I'm not saying it was bad. Do you think COVID actually made you think about things a little differently? Yep. Yeah. It, did you find it gave you time? It kind of forced you to sit down, like detention? Like it said, think about what we're doing. Did it, did it give you that opportunity or is psychologically? Yeah, for, for some of it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I know it's it's different for everybody. Some people got COVID, which really affected them, uh, and their work is probably still does affect them yeah. today, health wise. But um, you know, a lot of people felt closed in, and their work either you know exploded and became great pieces of work they had thought they had more time to work on each individual piece like mm -hmm. this how long was this going to last they didn't know it's sort of like you were given a jail sentence for some yeah. and some didn't you know some didn't pay attention to it they just went about life as normal because mm -hmm. artists are they're individuals and they they live they work alone they don't work yeah you know you <laughs> do you work uh, mostly in your studio at home or a little bit in the labs as well at university uh, mostly at home sometimes in the lab depending on yeah. the size of the work yeah but at least when you're out teaching, you you have access to other people that are doing similar things or wanting things. So mm -hmm. you find your students have explored in different ways the same thing that you're working on. You found discovery from them a little bit on some ideas or uh, some ideas. Yeah. Um... Mostly they're there to learn uh, the technical aspects of how to do something. Yeah, that's a big part of it for sure. So. You know, they probably should all have our aprons with help me on it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> some do, some don't. <laughs> <laughs> this should be the standard piece of equipment that says mm -hmm. handed out. I just found that 
as a student myself years ago, he said, you can make such silly mistakes because you didn't pay attention to what was said. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, no, you don't put acid down the drain. You just like, there's little things you think that oil and water don't mix. You know, there's some very basic rules. <laughs> and at a certain point, you're, he's watching me. I'm going to be nervous and you, and you'll make a big mistake and you think, no, no, you shouldn't be. It, Cause it is really a, a process based uh, medium, right? You've yep. got to, you've got to follow. If you don't follow certain things, it's just not going to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, yeah. Now th this is a long, narrow piece. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is the block and the thick. The next one is the print, which. Oh, okay. So this is the block and then we'll, okay. That's what it is. So this is the block What we're seeing. I should have put them side by side. Yeah. So, we'll just click. so there's the print. Mm-hmm. From the block and we're just going to go back to the block mm -hmm. so people can see you cut this piece in so what is white is what has been cut away yep yeah so they'll remove all those pieces and uh, then you'll with a roller you'd ink this block yeah, yep with a, with a roller and then uh and then they'd proof it it'd be proof like this with paper so is this a one or two color Sure. Just um, one color, just black on uh, Japanese paper. Um, okay. To get yeah, that color. color black. And this one's a large one. It's five feet tall. Oh, yeah. Five like, feet. Yeah, 20 inches, two and a half feet. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So, was this be done on uh, Baltic birch plywood? Yeah, I was given a piece of Baltic birch. Um, Michael Peterson, he used to run Boyd Gallery. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He moved to Ottawa, so he was giving, he was selling and giving away stuff from his his print studio. So he gave me this big giant piece of wood. Yeah, I think I gave him a a, a proofing press, a portable proofing press. I gave him uh, that for him to teach with right. years ago, mm -hmm. um, or they were using it in the studio years ago. Yeah, this one just has a look of multiple colors. The block it has this reddish tone. Yeah, I usually okay. for some of the wood blocks I do now, if I'm doing just black and white, I'll stain it red, and then I can draw on it with marker so I can see the, the lines. Right. And then when you're carving, you can see when you remove the the surface, you can see the color of the wood, so you can see what you're cutting. Good idea. No, good idea. I, I used to just work on a black surface and carve away, but I found that if you don't use the right kind of black, it releases when it gets wet. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to find uh, a resisted one that uh, absorbs into the wood, but doesn't react to water or anything when you're going. So you do you use a water-based inks at all, or uh, this or one is oil-based? Oil yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's the proof right there. Mm -hmm. No, it's lovely. Yeah, it's a big piece, long, long piece. How yeah. Many, how many proofs did you make of this one, about? Like three, <laughs> I my press wasn't big enough, so I had to do it by hand. Oh my god, hand rub. Okay, I just thought maybe you'd run them at uh, university through the big press. There, no, the press is too small. <laughs> no, they're still too small. You, know, you, you realize you have to. The bed has to be as long as the proof. At least, yeah, a little bit longer actually, probably. So you mm -hmm. need a six foot bed at least for that to go yeah. through the the whole thing. You have to go to Toronto, you know, to open. Yeah, open studio or someplace. To, yeah, or U of A has a big enough yeah. press. Mm -hmm. I thought they had bigger presses at U of S than that, but I guess they don't. Uh, well, the presses might be a little bit bigger. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. I know they had a couple of big screen screen uh, presses, but mm -hmm. this one, you know, is it is this the, the juggling bear? You know, it's... Um, what is it? I'm sorry, what is that? Is it's that a prairie a, dog. People call it a bear, a prairie too. Dog. Okay, it's, it's, it's large, so... <laughs> well, I, yeah. No, I, so is it kind of a, a planetary thing around them, a little universe? and uh, um, a, little, a little bit, yeah. Uh, I did this one for Nuit Blanche last year. Okay. So... Um, so I belong to, I'm on the board of uh, Saskatchewan Printmakers. So okay. we're a, a printmaking collective um, based on Saskatchewan. Yeah. And we did a, a steamroller event. So people ink, uh, carved uh, liner blocks. And then during the, the evening, we um, inked them up and then uh, printed them using uh, a steamroller. 
<laughs> so this is a big piece. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I have it over here. Um, yeah, like three feet maybe tallish. Yeah. So he actually yeah. had the steam. He had a, uh, a, what yeah, sure, brother, yeah. a big, a big roller go over top of it. Yep. Yeah. Like they would use on the, on the highway or crushing or, uh, parking lots or something like that. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Have you, okay. Oh, have you ever done, uh, inking of, uh, what do you call them? Uh, grates or, uh, you know, like manhole covers, manhole covers and different. Yeah. yeah. They're always a, a fun thing to try those, uh, making shirts with a manhole cover on them. I always thought, mm -hmm. I did a tour of Ottawa one year and I must have found 20 different manhole covers and, and grates are just very cool mm -hmm. uh, because the simplicity of them are so unique, whether it be a, in the drains, a lot of times there'd be a fish. And if the mm -hmm. fish is on there, that meant that don't pour anything down there that isn't good for the environment. So okay. cool. the little fish that was on and it's actually it was embossed into the, the casting for the drain, but a lot of the manhole covers are very interesting because they're age related. So some of the stuff was from, you know, almost a hundred years old. Some of these, these, these old, does it cast iron pieces? And they uh, always thought they were very interesting pieces to work on this. Yeah. And this, you know, people understanding that when you make a print, you can use whatever you want to, uh, to press on that where you're, like this, you can get big pieces like plywood, cutting four by eight sheets of plywood almost if you have access to, um, you know, a roller, a big something to press on it. So, so there'd be one color inked and, uh, and yeah. You go. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have quite a crowd of people watching while they're being done or? Whew, yeah, it was a busy, busy, busy night. It was just nonstop. It was really fun. Like this one I did later in the studio, so it's printed nice and cleaned. Uh, during the night, we were just inking and printing and hoping for the best. Everyone, walked, everyone like uh, members from the community donated their blocks, including myself, and then people walked away with prints. So, Oh, cool. There that, people well, yeah, people really like that. They, they like feeling... A part of it. It's just unfortunate the artists are always giving his away. But I think, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, oh, I'll buy something from you later in your life. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But I think it's uh, it's nice to interact with people when people can see this kind of stuff explode and come out. You know, yep. think, oh, I never thought that would ever happen, and and it, it's a permanent uh, remembrance for a lot of people. I think it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But be able to do something like that. Nuit Blanche. I've been to one. I haven't done. Very much yeah you gotta take your night stick with you a little bit sometimes it depends what part of town you're in <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun events though yeah there we go here's another one of your uh, animal now is this the plate this is the plate yeah, the yeah plate. It's the plate and it's got rabbit and two cats yep and the fire in the center yeah no i find this would make a lovely book you know, they, they, you know, the pieces are, uh, because there's, there's, it's very lyrical as far as there's a story here. And I want to know what is this story about? And it's, it's, uh, you know, this jumping rabbit and two cats and they're just going, well, you just need, you need to hook up with some writer or yourself and, and get this down into some kind of wording. Mm -hmm. It probably not, it would not need very much wording, uh, but leave some room for, because they they inspire an idea and a thought. Say, what is this about, right? So the center section of this this print mm -hmm. uh, is the next one, the actual piece, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right there. What is that a fire or is that? Uh, mm -hmm. So the cats are going to have some roast rabbit. Is that? Uh, <laughs> uh, I hope not. Um. <laughs> no. the, the jumping <laughs> rabbit. Yeah. Jumping rabbit over the fire. Um, yeah, with so the, I said, like the the cat and the. The cow jumps over the moon, you know, the old, the, the old, the old story. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. About it's like a, it's a, I think it's a Persian custom uh, to start the new year. Um, you jump over small fires. Oh, like, okay. So um, I've been starting to think about a new series. This one in the, the juggling bear prairie dog about um, 
repetition and like ritual. Uh, one of the comments someone said about the the juggler was it? It was like almost like a, a magician or a shaman. They're like right. just kind of like, so. I, I kind of like this and idea of repetition ritual it it relates to printmaking because so often we you know when you're printing you have to roll and it's always repeating the roll you're running things through the press and this is constant motion you're doing the same thing over and over again and it becomes kind of like a, a ritual in a way yeah so i'm thinking about that for a new series of work yeah well, I can see, yeah i could see that for sure the uh the ritual aspect like it like making a, a sword the Japanese would, you know, there's a ritual of cool down and then heat back up and they fold the material over until they get folded so many times it sh keeps the edge sharp on the sword as a, but it takes, like you said, there's a ritual to doing it in printmaking very much so. You you have to follow regime mm -hmm. if you're going to keep things consistent, but uh, between a body of work. So in other words, you've got 10 proofs that are, that are looking very, very similar to each other's and they're hand pulled. They're not produced by a machine, yeah. um, but there he is, the man, the man. Hey, right guys, there. how's it going? Very, I like this stuff. In fact, I was on your website. I like the owl on the oh, website. <laughs> I like the, I thought that was very cool. I don't know. And then there was the, I want to say a, a dolphin or a whale. That was also yeah. very cool. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I look good stuff. Yeah, that was very, very, very cool. So now here's my question, because this is what everybody's going to ask. So if someone wants to buy something, what's it cost? Um, um it's free no. it's free no. um, <laughs> the mesotints usually range i guess if i'm selling them through a gallery now um, forget it you're gonna have people come through the show so yeah. like if someone says to you patrick i love your stuff i saw it on the show what do you charge a normal person not what the gallery because they mark it up ten thousand percent and give you a dollar um, so it, yeah he wants to be from the bottom <laughs> end to the top end so don't yeah, don't yeah. be be kind of general about it don't no. You don't have to give me a specific. It's A, a to Z. Is it? Um, they usually range from 150 to 500. That's not bad, and that's Canadian. Yeah. So, so four dollars US to seven dollars and fifty cents US. <laughs> perfect. And then if you're in Europe, free. So there you go. <laughs> so, I like the way that works. But you pay for shipping, and that's where he makes the money. Uh, that's like 500 euros. Uh, so there you go. The but I encourage people to look at his website because there's some amazing work on there as well. We couldn't. We'll just have the link. We'll have the link below, so yeah. you guys can check out his website, check out his work. If you can't figure out how to get a hold of Patrick, get a hold of us. We'll put you in touch. Um, and and uh, as well on Artists in Canada as well, he's there, yep. so we we'll gladly hook you up. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. It was a, a very short, insightful uh, uh, way of looking at printmaking because. It's a, it's a complicated product or project of some of the stuff that you're working on, but I think it's uh, it, it, not, there's not that many printmakers really per se in the world. It's a kind of a, a, a that chosen profession, and uh, but it like I said before, it's a it's a great intro way for people to start their collections. Uh, very economical, and uh, I love your work. I mean, you got to get that book done. There's there's a book in there or two. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be, I think I'd be first in line to get a book for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. But anyway. I just expect a free copy autographed. Just so you know, much you, um, so, yeah, it's just the way it goes. <laughs> so Patrick, it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you everybody for watching. We'll Thank see you. you next Thursday with another fantastic artist out of Canada. And once again, Patrick's links are below if you need to get a hold of them, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Have a great day. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Patrick. You have a good one. <laughs>